I will explore some of the hottest business and economic topics. The thing is, at least it's in the Philippines, because there's always going to be a conflict at some point between commercial considerations and social considerations. Well, how does the crop insurance extend to the credit as well? Whenever a bank lends to either rice or corn, by law, that loan must be covered by crop insurance. Good evening, I'm Ben Kritz, and this is Eye on Business. For tonight's show, I'm going to do something a little different. This is Friday's Manila Times. Here's the headline. Countries scramble to stop deadly virus. That's scary, right? Deadly virus. And of course, this story is about the so-called neo coronavirus, which is going through China right now. And as of this issue of the paper, there's been about 17 people killed and about 570 that have been diagnosed as having the virus. Well, let's put this in a little perspective. There's 1.5 billion people in China. 570 is not that many. Now, that's not to say this is not a serious illness, but Here's things that can kill you faster than this virus. Getting struck by lightning, getting eaten by a hippopotamus in Africa, slipping and falling down in your bathtub. So why is this story so frightening? That's what I'm gonna talk about tonight. Now about 10 years ago, after I had a career in a different industry, I decided to make this, being a part of this thing we call the media, my life's work. And in those 10 years, I've witnessed some fundamental changes in what media actually means and what purpose it serves in our modern society. And if I may share a little personal insight, I got into this work because I am, first of all, a writer by nature. The fact that I'm sitting here telling you this in the country's newest TV studio instead of on the pages of the country's oldest daily newspaper is just a matter of format. Second, as a student of history, I have always been fascinated by the media in, as an industry and in terms of its role in society. I have certain ideas about what that role should be, but the best way to understand something is to become a part of it. So here I am, kind of Dr. Livingston among the pygmies. Of course, no job is worthwhile unless it has some purpose, and mine, as I see it, is to help my audience, you, be a little smarter about the world around you and the economy that makes it all work. Now, if I'm doing my job right, you will know something you didn't before, and hopefully, you can make better decisions for your family and for your business. You can protect yourself from potential risks and find new opportunities. Media has changed so much in recent years, however, that you can't take it for granted any longer that content from the newspaper or the TV is unquestionable or absolute. It's still useful, but in order for it to be useful to you, you need to understand how media works. So, after a break, we'll turn our eye on the media business. I'll be right back. Welcome back. In my study of the media industry, I've discovered two important secrets. Now, they're not really secrets, but most people aren't aware of them, so they may as well be. If you understand these two important characteristics of this concept we call media, not only will it be more useful to you, your knowledge as an informed consumer will make media better. So here we go. 
The first thing you need to understand about the media is that everyone is the media. In the internet age, social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, things like that, social media allows everyone to be a media outlet. If you are sharing content for a public audience, you are the media. You're doing the same job I am. That's true. A lot of what counts as media under that definition is frankly ridiculous. But access to audiences has been levelized. Everyone has an equal platform. Just because I'm here in a TV studio does not mean that I have that much bigger a reach than you do sitting at home on your webcam in front of your laptop or your desktop computer or using your cell phone. We all reach the same crowd. Now, this TV studio, this newspaper, is on an equal footing with this. Now you might laugh, but that cat vlog you just saw a clip of has 1.29 million subscribers. In a sense, that's a good thing because that hypothetically makes all human knowledge available to everyone all the time. But media, as we think of it, newspapers, radio, television, the conventional media, we can no longer shape opinion or guide knowledge by controlling its sources and its flow because everybody has the same access to everything. Those cats have their own vlog. So that means the only limits on knowledge are the choices that you, the audience, make. You know, what you choose to watch is what you can learn. You can watch anything you like. You want to watch the, me? I appreciate that. You want to watch the cat video? You watch the cat video. You know, there, there is no, there, there's no difference in the amount of influence we actually have. And that's the downside of the modern media, is unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your point of view, your choice, often enough, is to watch the cat video. That matters, and it presents a significant challenge because of the second secret about the media, which I'll share after another short break. But I just want to add one thing about social media and conventional media. Because we all share the same world, the same platform, we're all governed by the same rules, which means that your choice that you make when you choose to watch me, or you choose to watch the cat video, or you choose to watch another TV network, or read certain websites, your choice stays with you. And that's because of something they call the algorithm, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Let's take a break, and when I come back, we'll talk about the second important aspect of the media business. Mga isyung pinag-uusapan, mga palitang laman ng pahayagan, impormasyong dapat niyong malaman, tatalakayin, pupusisiin, at hihimayin ni Mario Garcia kasama ang kanyang mga panauhin sa harap ng bayan. Face off! And I'm back. Let's have a little history lesson. Throughout its history, until the age of the internet, media has occupied a special place in society. You may have heard the term called the fourth estate. Media has been described as the fourth estate. And that's a term that comes to us from medieval times. The first three estates were the church, the nobility, the common people, and then the fourth one is the press. Each one of those had a certain influence and a certain amount of power over the way society works. You know, we in the media would like to think that we still have that kind of power. But here's the problem. 
in the modern age because, as I said before, everyone is the media now. That's no longer true. The common people and the media, the third and the fourth estates, have now run together. And so the public has much more influence over the way things go. So that's the second thing that we need to understand about the media is that media is a business. I've described it as the media business. It really is a business. The product that we produce with our business is content, information, data, news, entertainment, however you want to put it. It's information. Now, of course, media has always been a business. Printers have always printed their paper and sold them to other people. Of course, you know, if we want to produce news, we need money to produce the news. We need to pay my rent and buy groceries and buy things for my kids. You know, and that's, that's how it works. But up until the early part of the 20th century, there was a monopoly on information. You got your news from the newspaper. And because there was that monopoly, the media business could behave as though it wasn't a business. It could behave as though it was a separate entity in society. And people perceived it as such. They thought of it as the press, even though the press was made up of many different individual companies, individual publishers that were competing with each other. Collectively, they were all the same and doing the same thing. <clears throat> what it really means is that the currency has changed. Back in the old days, the connection between news, the product, the information, and the customer, which was everybody that read the news, was that it was a direct connection. Newspaper sold it to the subscriber or to the guy on the street that bought it from the newsstand. It sold the information directly to the reader. The money flowed back from the reader to the publisher. That started to change in the early part of last century, 1920s into the 1930s, and then, of course, very quickly after World War II. It began with change with the advent of radio and then television. And the reason why is because in those days, there was no way for a television studio like this or a radio station to actually sell their content to the person who was consuming it. It would get broadcast into the air and anybody that owned a radio or owned a television set could just consume that content, listen to the music, listen to the news, watch the TV programs. They weren't paying to do that. that switch in the way the media business works accelerated with the growth of the internet. <clears throat> so what this means is that we no longer have a direct connection to the audience in terms of running a business. This is very important because, as I said, this is a business. We don't do this out of charity. This is for profit, you know. Sorry to break that to you, but, you know, we, although we do it out of love, we also do it because we make money on it, and everybody like us is in the same boat. So now, what it means is you, our audience, you are our currency. The more of an audience we have, the more currency we have, and we use that to buy advertising. In other words, the more viewers I have, the more someone will want to advertise their service or their business or their product on my show, or in our newspaper, or anywhere else. So that's basically what happens is I collect you, the audience, 
and the bigger my collection, the more advertising I can have and the more money I make. The bigger the audience, the bigger the advertising, the bigger our revenue. Business. Since anybody in the internet age can provide a product we call information and then be the media, this business that we're in has become much more competitive. I'm competing with the cat video and everything else that's on the internet, every other TV station, every other newspaper. And when you get into a situation where things are competitive, that leads to a lot of compromises. And it's what we call in this business sacred cows. I remember some tips that I was given before I started as a columnist with the Manila Times about seven years ago, actually just exactly seven years ago this month. He said, find out who the sacred cows are because everyone has them, and it's true, you know. Um, there's really no such thing as objective reporting anymore. And I know that some of my colleagues who are probably listening to this are terrified, you know, to hear somebody say it out loud, but that's the truth. All news reporting in particular, and when especially when you get into things like entertainment or sports or other aspects of the news, all of it is slanted one way or another. And the reason it is is because we want to maximize our audience which maximizes our advertising, which maximizes our revenue. It's a simple formula. And there's several ways in which things can be slanted without being unethical about our reporting, which is another thing that I'll talk about in a few minutes. We can favor or disfavor certain businesses, corporations, organizations, politicians, you know, give of some more prominence than others, you know, completely ignore some that we don't like. You know, and there's other ways to do it too. Uh, you're familiar with the term clickbait. You know, headlines like the headline in our paper this morning, although that is a factual story, that, isn't, that is completely true what that headline says. The way that we word things is meant to grab your attention. I do that when I write my column three, three times a week. You know, I know you as a news reader are going to read the title of something first. And unless that title grabs your attention, you're not going to read the rest of it. And so I put it in such a way that will get your attention and get you to read the rest of the information I have to present. When you do it on the internet, that's called clickbait. You do it in a newspaper, that's called good journalism. They teach that in school. They, Teach that in school here at the Manila Times College. But since we have to be flexible and bear in mind that we're maximizing our audience, our willingness to be flexible, actually our need to be flexible, also determines our access. For example, yeah, if we want to co cover a particular politician or a particular government department, you know, our access is determined by how well they think we treat them. You will notice when you read the newspapers just from, just from around Manila, pick up a paper any, any day and read the political news you will notice that most of the stories tend to be very positive if they are being reported firsthand. In other words, the reporter has gone to Malakan Yang, has gone to the Department of Finance or the Department of Agriculture or the Department of Tourism and is getting the information firsthand from the government official. You'll find those stories are positive. And the reason why is because politicians are very thin-skinned. President Duterte has been several times criticized, sometimes has been a source of humor because of his anger towards the press sometimes. But if you think about it, 
every president since the age of television, at least in, if you read history, goes back even farther than that. Every president, every politician has disliked criticism. So there's a problem of access. If we're mean, they're not going to let us have access, and then we don't get the information that we use to build the audience. And we need to build the audience because we need the financial resources that advertising and sponsorships bring in. <clears throat> it works the same way with other areas besides politicians, too. Certain companies won't talk to you if you have been critical in the past. So that's what I said. You can test this for yourself. You read newspaper articles that come from the source. In other words, the palace has done something. The news story is taking the information directly from the palace spokesman. It's going to be a positive story. If the story is critical, I can almost guarantee you that does not come from someone who was actually there to get the information directly from the source. Now, the critical ones, they have determined that their audience is a certain way, and so they do things their certain way. That final piece of this puzzle in determining audiences and the amount of access everybody has and what you read and what you hear is called the algorithm. And I'm sure you've heard this term. It's Facebook has a very powerful one. Every social media site does. Twitter has one. It's not quite as strong as Facebook's. Instagram is the same way. What an algorithm does, and I'm not a mathematician or a computer scientist. It's a term that comes from mostly from computer science. What an algorithm does is it learns what you are interested in. And because there is such a vast amount of information on a platform like Facebook, for instance, you know, individuals on Facebook, we as a TV studio and as a newspaper are also on Facebook, there's such a vast amount of information being shared that all that information from everybody all over the world, two billion users, that should all be available to everybody all the time. But just managing that much information is so difficult that what Facebook and similar organizations, Google, etc., what they do is they, they use an algorithm. And what the algorithm does is it learns what you're interested in by what you look at, by what you search for. And as time goes on, it will learn better and better the things that you're interested in. And so you'll notice after a while, everything that it suggests to you or that it shows you automatically, all of a sudden matches your tastes and matches your opinions. You know, if you are not a supporter of President Duterte, you tend to look at news articles or comments from other users that are critical of him, pretty soon you're going to find out that's all you're seeing is anti-Duterte stuff. Same goes if you're a supporter of him or if you have a particular cause. Say you are a ardent environmentalist. You are interested in stories about climate change, renewable energy, what people are doing to help the planet, pretty soon that's all you're going to start seeing. You know, so now, what we have, instead of the old format, where you had media as a piece of society, as the fourth estate, you have media but it's not one thing anymore. It's many, 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 many little things. And all of these things are competing for everyone's attention. So instead of the old media that was almost monolithic, now you have one that's like grains of sand. 
It's all competing for everyone's attention, but it's controlled in platforms because we use the internet. We can't get away from the internet anymore. It's controlled in platforms where the audience's tastes channel it into particular directions. And that's not good for us in the news business because we need to build an audience. We need to reach more and more people all the time, not just because we're in it for the money, but because what we, have, we feel what we have to say is important and will help the world become a better place because people will know more and be able to make better decisions. But if you as an audience member are being channeled in a certain direction, we might miss you. And that's just not a good thing. So let's take another short break. And when I come back, we'll talk about some ways in which we can all make the media in the media business work a little bit better. Okay, welcome back. Now let's take a deep breath and see what have we learned this evening. Okay, well, a couple of things. One, you can get information from anywhere you want. Hypothetically. Everything that is known to mankind at this very moment is available to everyone. And it makes this a wonderful world. You know, as many problems as the internet and the digital age causes us, this is still a great time to be alive. Unfortunately, the second thing we've learned is every bit of that information is biased in some way. Now, as I explained earlier, part of that is because this is a business. It has to be biased because we need an audience. You know, we need audience because 
we have content to sell and in order to get the content to sell we need to not make the people who make you know give us things to talk about we need to not make them angry uh, unfortunately that's how it goes and some of it of course too is our own personal and institutional perspectives on things our ideology our morals and ethics and things like that for example my education in economics was based on was generally known as the behavioralist school of thought uh, it's a particular worldview that makes me look at business and the economy a certain way um, you know there's other there's other schools of thought too but you know I have that I, I have that perspective because that matches you know my personal moral code and view of the world you know the newspaper has a certain editorial policy and certain perspective that we follow here um, we see ourselves as supporting the government as an idea that there should be a strong government and a strong democracy but that what the government does right or wrong should be reported honestly and objectively you know so within these particular lenses that we have that gives us one way to slant the news and then we have to consider the business so our ideology is always tempered by our need to build and keep an audience like it or not we can't bite the hands that feed us or if we can't avoid doing so because we have to honor the facts and truth we try to do that in as painless a way as possible and then there's the media biases and then there's your own biases and as I explained before the way media platforms work like social media platforms or even search engines on the internet your biases are reinforced due to the algorithm feeding you what it has detected that you want to look at that's called confirmation bias you're more likely to read watch and listen to information that already matches your own opinions and worldview now I realize this is all very discouraging and like I said I'm sure that there are many of my colleagues that would be listening to this kind of discussion and would be absolutely horrified that I'm kind of pulling the curtain back on what's behind the machine but it doesn't mean that principles should be absent we still have a duty to present you verifiable facts make logical arguments present all sides of the story these are all the best practices of journalism we teach these here at our own school any journalism student anywhere hears them and should take them to heart in my work I certainly try to because I'm responsible for what I do you know those are rules to live by I can have my opinion but it must be based on fact if it's not it's not helpful to you it's not helpful to me so there is a certain amount of an ethical rudder to it but it's still a business and it's still biased that's unfortunate but there's no way around that I'm sorry you know news media is biased and the information you get is biased it is not going to be the unvarnished truth with no color to it whatsoever so what do you do about that well the first thing you do is after you're through watching this show and listening to me talk about it watch somebody else's show read a different newspaper don't read just a newspaper every day read three or four of them watch several networks watch a different newscast every night ask questions 
you want to break up that algorithm that's telling you what you want to hear, but that's defeating your natural inclination because things that you don't want to hear make you uncomfortable. Make yourself uncomfortable. Find out something that you didn't know. I'll give you a personal example. I am not a supporter of the President of the United States. Um, that's putting it as nicely as possible. I cannot stand the President of the United States. He should not be the President of the United States. But if I wasn't willing to swallow that distaste I have for Donald Trump and read some of the news from people who are biased towards him, Fox News, some of the so-called conservative or right-wing news outlets, commentators who support him, you know, I would not know what everybody is thinking. I would only know what that half of the world that doesn't like him is thinking, which means that my knowledge is diminished by half. I don't like to read and listen to things supporting to Donald Trump, but that's still a part of the world. And in order for me to know as much as I can, I have to experience all of it. So there's no such thing as a truly objective source. But if you really want to learn about the world, and you should want to learn about the world, you need to make an effort to seek out different points of view. Go to your Facebook, follow people and organizations you think you disagree with. Watch a different newscast every night. Read a different newspaper every day. Read two or three newspapers every day if you have time for it. When you begin doing that, you're going to discover something interesting. At least a part of your own point of view will change. Some of it will probably be reinforced, and if so, that's great. I mean, some of your convictions will become stronger when you read the other point of view. But you're going to change your mind about certain things. And you shouldn't feel bad about that, because what that means is your mind is expanding, your knowledge is growing, and so is your world. Might not make you happier, but it's going to make you smarter. And it's going to make you see the world in a broader way, bigger, brighter, and more complex than you ever imagined. And when you can see the world that way, when you understand more, you can do more. You can do more with yourself, your own career, your business, your family, your country. <clears throat> see the world with a clearer eye. Listen to people other than me. Read news other than what we produce. You'll be a better person. The country we live in will be a better place. And this will be a better world. I'm Ben Kritz, and this has been Eye on Business.